We'd like to give a warm welcome to each and every one that's able to tune in to this live broadcast. And hopefully you'll be encouraged and uplifted by our lesson today from the Word of God that Richard presents, that we can all be uplifted and encouraged as we listen. We'll now have some announcements. Following the announcements, we'll have a prayer, and then uh, Matthew Webb will have a scripture reading, and then Richard will present our lesson. We are happy to announce that Sandra Stewart was baptized Thursday at the building. Her address is in the bulletin insert that was emailed. Be sure to send her a card and welcome her to our family. Also, the Senior Family Center of Charlotte County is offering free meals to senior citizens. Info is also in the bulletin insert. Next, we have a lot of sick that we need to remember. We may remember uh, Lenny Noter. He has begun chemotherapy and has been had a scan Thursday and will be get the results on Tuesday. Please pray for good results. Heidi has been suffering from extreme back pain. Also, Joe Paula gets the results from his bone marrow uh, biopsy Thursday, or Tuesday rather. Pray for good results for him. Also, Kimberly Wills began her chemotherapy yesterday in Fort Myers. We will be setting up food deliveries to the family soon. Next, we have um, Todd Harris. He's continued to um, recover, improve from his open heart surgery. Uh, Debbie Hopkins was diagnosed with cancer, lung cancer this week. She is awaiting treatment plan now. Dennis also is experiencing back problems. Please keep them both in your prayers. Also, Mary Ann McGowan has been also diagnosed with lung cancer. She is awaiting treatment. Leslie Tucker is asking for prayers for the safety of several of her family members currently working with the COVID-19 patients at New York hospitals. Finally, we want to keep uh, Joyce Cleveland and Phyllis Silva in our prayers as they grieve as each have lost their husband. We'll now have a prayer and then we'll turn for scripture reading to Matthew and then Richard will be presenting our lesson. Dear Father in heaven, we're just so thankful for the many blessings that you give us, for the life that we have, and the trust that we have in you, Father, that we can trust you. When others we seem like we can't trust, but we know that we can trust you, Father. We pray, Father, that you would just continue to bless each of us, help us to try to stay in contact with each other, even though we're not together, that we can still contact and be in touch with each other. And Father, we just pray that you will be with the leaders of this country, be with the president, be with those advisors, those medical advisors that advise president, that they may be wise enough, Father, to look to you for strength, courage. We just pray, Father, that they will make the right decision on, on what we should do and what we should not do, Father. And Father, we just ask you to be with all the doctors that are uh, tending to all the patients, be with all the nurses, all the help that is doing delivering. And pray, Father, you just uh, lift them up, strengthen them, Father, and we just bless them. And Father, we just ask you to be with those uh, people that are working in grocery stores and pharmacies and Walmart or wherever the necessities are that we need. We just thank you for them, Father, that they will be safe and watch over them. Father, just continue to bless us, continue to watch over us and keep us safe and know, Father, that we can count on you, Father, and we know that you are in control of the situation. Father, just bless us now and watch over us. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. The scripture reading will be in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 9. Again, it is in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 9. And it says, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, 
and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and was esteemed him not. Surely he has bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. We're grateful that you are here this morning, whether you're listening to us live, or you're watching on YouTube or Facebook uh, at our service later on. We're thankful for David being here this morning, and to give us the announcements and the prayer for Matthew Webb and his scripture reading from the book of Isaiah chapter 53. So thankful that you are here. If I asked you to describe the word love, what would you say? That's one of those words that might not be easily described or defined. I love going to kids and in their simplicity and their answers. Uh, kids were asked, uh, what do you think about love and marriage? These are some of the answers. Glenn, age seven, said, if falling in love is anything like learning how to spell, I just don't want to do it. It's just too hard. John, age nine, said, love is like an avalanche where you have to run for your life. I love Mary, age eight. I think you're supposed to get shot with an arrow or something but the rest of it just isn't supposed to be so painful. I love Kenny, age seven. He says, it gives me a headache to think about that kind of stuff. I'm just a kid. I don't need that kind of trouble. Ava, age eight, says, one of you should know how to write a check because even if you have tons of love, there's going to be a lot of bills. Isn't that correct? Floyd, age nine, said, love is foolish but I still might try it someday. And Dave, age eight, says this, love will find you even if you're trying to hide from it. I've been trying to hide from it ever since I was five years old, but the girls just keep finding me. Love. Today we want to talk about love from the book of John chapter three and verse 16. It's probably one of the most familiar verses you'll find. Our children memorize it from a very young age. It's one of the first verses maybe that we even teach our kids. It's familiar in such a way that Martin Luther called it the heart of the Bible, the gospel in miniature. It's true that I think in John chapter 3 and verse 16, we truly find the greatest definition of sacrificial love. That we can find. Read with me in verse 16. It says there, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. As you read these 25 words, it's almost as if they're too simple. Almost as if that it's hard to even comprehend uh, their greatness or the power that is in these 25 words. God very well could have said, and it would have meant almost the same thing, I guess, simply God 
loves me. But you see, to God, that wasn't enough. And he inserted a tiny word that gives it even a more powerful meaning to you and I today. It tells us there in verse 16, For God so loved the world. That little word added means simply to an extreme degree. We could read it at like this, that God so loved the world to such a great and wondrous uh, uh, part here that he would, he would love it to that extreme that he would send his only son to give his life for you and I. His love towards us is to that extreme degree. Today you might be sitting in your homes or wherever you're watching this. And the truth is all of us carry some degree or some sort of baggage with us. But by that I mean we might be going through trials. We might be going through problems. We might be going through uh, uncertainty in our lives. Maybe there are temptations that we find in our lives that we just can't get through. And at this very moment, we might be sitting there saying, you know what, I just don't know if I can keep going on. I don't even know if I even feel loved sometimes because there are so many things going on. Today, if you're feeling that way, I hope as you read John 3 and verse 16 that you will realize, despite whatever might be going on in our lives, despite the doubts or the shortcomings or the failings or the stumbling that we sometimes have in our walk, that we could say with all certainty that God loves you, God loves me, that God loves us, that we were created in his image, God's own image, and that I can't do anything that would stop God from loving me. You see, his love is timeless. His love is without division. I like that. But you see, John chapter 3 and verse 16 is simple. It's these simple words. And sometimes the simplicity of them can cause us perhaps to forget the power and the greatness that's in there. You see, the Gettysburg Address was made by Abraham Lincoln many years ago. It probably goes down without argument as one of the best political speeches ever given. But you see, the Gettysburg Address was simply 272 words. And it only lasted approximately two minutes for Lincoln to say it. Today, we don't even have a photograph of Abraham Lincoln giving the Gettysburg Address. And the reason we don't is because photographers didn't even have time to set up their cameras or to get ready to take a picture because political speeches back then were known to go hours. The political speech just prior to the Gettysburg Address was given by someone who spoke for two and a half hours. You see, that speech today, though, still goes down as one of the best political speeches, one of the most powerful speeches ever given, even though it was a short speech. John 3 and verse 16 is the same way. It's very short. It's to the point. And for sure, it embraces the point that God wanted to give. You see, through my, my struggles, through my discouraging moments, I can still, and you too, can take great comfort. And you can have that peace as Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7 promises, a peace that surpasses all understanding by knowing for sure that God loves you. That the love of God has been poured out in our hearts that in, as Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 tells us that God demonstrates or in other words, God proves his love for us. That's for me and for you. That in, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Look with me in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. Again, Ephesians chapter 2 beginning there in verse 4. It says there and it describes a God, it says, who is rich in mercy because of his great love in which he loved us. Look at this. Even when we were yet dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. Think about that. 
that God's grace was so great, that His love was to such an extreme, that it would be manifested towards me and towards you while we were yet sinners, while we would yet be dead in our trespasses. Go with me to 1 John chapter 4, beginning there in verse 7. And notice the progression. Notice the power that is in John chapter, 1 John chapter 4. In verse 7 it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. My friends, there's no better definition of God than simply saying God indeed is simply love. And then look at verse 9. It says, in this the love of God was manifested. What does that mean? That it was made clear, that it was made perfectly obvious to us. Towards us that while God sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. In this love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And that he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. What's a propitiation? That means Jesus Christ literally became my substitute, your substitute. That he assumed my obligations. That he covered my guilt. He covered your guilt. And in verse 11 it says, Beloved, if God so loved us, We all ought to love one another. We loved him because he first loved us, verse 16. In Romans chapter 8, there in verse 37, we find a powerful verse there talking about that, uh, that we are in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. What a God that we served. That he would go around and look around all of heaven And he would choose not to send an angel or or not to send somebody else. But he would look around and he would say, you know what? I love to such an extreme those that I created that I will actually send my only son. That I would love them enough to send my very best. That God would love me so to such an extreme. You see, as we sit here and we read and we listen again to John 3 and verse 16, it does seem just so familiar. Oftentimes it does lose its meaning. Oh, well, yes, it says that God loves me, but that's nothing special. Don't ever think that. John 3, 16 is the golden text of the Bible. I want you to think of it this way, that John chapter 3 and verse 16 tells us first of the greatest giver ever, God Almighty, that he gives the greatest gift ever, his only son, his only begotten son, to the greatest measure, to the entire world, and to the greatest future blessing, a guarantee, a promise of eternal life. There have been thousands of sermons preached, many children who memorized this simple verse, God so loved. You see, its importance is, this verse doesn't tell me that it's us desiring necessarily to find God. But the beauty of this verse is, it tells me that God desired to find us. Wherever we might be, to embrace us and to claim us as his very own. Isn't that a beautiful thought today? I like what John 3 and verse 16 tells me. That God so loved the world. And I'm glad it doesn't say that he loved just the rich and famous. Or that he loved just the smartest people. Or that he loved just the best looking. Or he would love just the select few. But 16 tells us that he loved the whole world. God goes far beyond all that man could do. He shows us and demonstrates towards us a love that is above that extreme. He gave us his only begotten son. There was a preacher who wrote this about Jesus Christ. It says there that God cared enough 
that he loved us enough that he would step down from the security of heaven. He would become a living, breathing man. A man who would know both hunger and thirst, that would experience friendship and love, but would also experience the rejection and hatred of men. That he would be insulted by those whom he actually created. And ultimately, he would die a cruel and excruciating death on a cross for them. This week, I want you to commit to me that you'll read Philippians chapter 2 and verses 5 through 8 there. Because that sums up the gift. Talking there about Jesus Christ being the nature of God. And I want you to read that. God didn't send a servant, a prophet, or even an angel to perform the important task that he needed to save you and I. It was so personal that God said, I have to come myself in the flesh. What a wonderful God that we serve. On this day and every day, how can we but not remember the, to the extreme of how God loved you and loved me and the gift that he gives us? I guess the question we might ask today is, how much does God love us? He loves me through my adversities. He loves me throughout whatever challenges I might find. And yes, I find that peace because of the love that God gives me. He truly loves me. He loves me. He loves you to that highest extent. So loved the world that he would send for us his very best. As we end this morning, I want to tell a story of a 67-year-old carpenter named Russell Herman. He died in 1994, and as they opened up his will, his will contained a staggering number of bequests. Among those was a promise of $2 billion for the city of St. Louis, over a billion and a half dollars for the state of Illinois, two and a half billion for the National Forest System, and just to top off the list, Herman left $6 trillion to the United States government to pay off part of the national debt. Now that's amazing, and that, that's generous of a man to give all of that. There was a big problem, though. When they found out what he owned, they were able to find he only owned one item, and that was a 1983 Oldsmobile. Well, that didn't go very far on his promises. You see, his promises were generous, yes. They would mean a lot. Well, yes, they could. But his promises ended up being meaningless because there was nothing to back them up. You see, this morning, and whenever you think about John chapter 3 and verse 16, that God loved us to that extent. When God makes a promise, you see, they aren't meaningless because God backs them up. And he backed it up to, with us in sending his very son to die on that cross and to be ro risen on the third day. To defeat death so that we might have eternal life. If you're here this morning and you're listening to this and you think, I just don't know if I'm right with God. I don't know how to become a Christian. We urge you to call our church number. We'll be happy to sit down with you to study, to offer you a free Bible correspondence course. We would love to pray with you and talk to you about God's Word and to talk to you more about Jesus Christ. If you're here and, or you're at home and you need to have the prayers of the church, we are here for you. Please uh, call us. We are here for us. Any of our elders, our deacons, we'd be happy to be of service. Again, uh, we thank you for being with us this morning. And Again, we serve such a wonderful God. Would you please bow with me as we go to our Heavenly Father in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we've had the privilege of studying your word and to contemplate on the greatness of your Son and our Savior, Christ Jesus. The greatness, Father, of your love. That you loved us so much to that great extent that you would send the very best, your only Son. Father, we're grateful for his sacrifice upon that cross, his willingness to give his life, to shed his blood for us, for the pain and the agony that he went through. And we're thankful, Father, that he arose on that third day. And we know, Father, that he is on your right hand even today, that he defeated death 
so that we might have eternal life. Father, we're thankful for him. We're thankful for all the blessings that you give us each and every day of our lives. Father, we continue to pray for each of those that need our prayers, for those that might be suffering, those that might be discouraged. We pray, Father, they might always look to you and look to John 3 and verse 16 and that great love that you showed for us. Father, we're grateful again for all that you do. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.